Well, this morning I'd ask that you would turn to the book of Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. We're going to be in chapter 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 6. Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. If you would read with me the first, uh, let's read the first three verses, I guess. It says, a, a son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. To you priests who despise my name, yet you say in what way? And we despise your name. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what ways have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. If y'all would pray with me. Father, we come to you again, and we thank you again, Father, for this time we come together. We thank you for your word that you give us, Father. And Father, I pray that right now that you would use your word, that you would speak to all of our hearts here today, Father, and that we would respond to your words, respond to your calling, Father, that we would obey you and do as you please, Father. Father, we thank you again. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name, and amen. So, pretty pretty rough way to start, right? When we when we when we jump straight into this text and and Malachi, you know, he's a we don't know a whole lot about Malachi. The uh, Bible, the the commentaries, they they don't say a whole lot about him. He was the he was the last of a long string of prophets to to speak. Um, he was the last one before John the Baptist some 400 years later. Um, not a whole lot about him, but it was it was not about the messenger. It was all about the message, right? It wasn't about him. Sometimes we, we you know, um, if you get a, a, a package, it's not about who delivered the package, it's what the package is, right? That's kind of the way this was. And, and God is, through Malachi, speaking to the, the Jewish remnants, which now has returned back to their land and they've they've been there for over a hundred years now the captivity is in the background and all things are pretty prosperous now they're they're doing good right they're doing good they've rebuilt the temple they're going through the ritual of it but they're far from god they have slowly drifted away and we see this a lot through the history of, of the Jewish people, right? Going up and down, that's close or far away, they're close. Well, right now they're 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 far away. We see in, in verse six when when God says, you know, a son honors his father, a servant honors his master, I'm both. So where's my honor? Right? He says, You neither honor me, you neither serve me. He says, where is my reverence? Where is my respect that, that I deserve? You know, it, it wasn't something that happened overnight. How many knows how to bull a frog? Everybody's like, what was that? There's an old saying that says if you want a bull a frog, you can't just have a bowl of water and throw a frog in it because it will jump right back out. Right? It's too hot. But if you take that same frog and put it in some nice lukewarm water and then slowly start turning the heat up, it gets used to the heat as it gets going and it'll stay in there until it dies, until it, until it boils itself to death. Right? That's kind of the way that the Israelites here are. You know, it wasn't, if, if somebody would have come up and tried to do some of this right off the bat, they would have been stoned to death for, for blasphemy. But as it slowly changed, this gradual change that happened, nobody really noticed it, and they was okay with it. And now we'll see that they've come to a point that they're just completely missing 
who God is. They're going through the same rituals. They're going through the motions, but missing who God is completely. You can see it when, when God confronts them with these questions. You'll see them, they'll say, what, us? In, in what way are we whatever? In what way, what way, what way have we despised your name? In what way have we profound you? They were so caught up in all the rituals of it that they missed who God was. We see in, in verse 7 and 8, it says, You offer defiled food on my altar, but in say, what ways have we defiled you? And by saying the table of the Lord is contemptible or useless or worthless. They was, God was telling them what they was offering was really a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as the perfect Lamb of God. But what they was doing at this point was completely opposite. Um, say that there's a cattle farmer. He raises some nice cattle. And he's got a bull that always wins the ribbon. The best there was. But one day, that cow gets, that bull gets sick. They call the vet in, and the vet says, man, there's nothing we can do. It, it, this bull's going to die. And he goes, okay. So the next morning, he hurries and loads it up in the truck, brings it down to the temple, marches it in there. And, and the priests know that something's wrong with this bull, but they say, eh, we'll take it anyway, because this is a prominent man in the, in the, in the community. Well, then everybody around says, wow, look at the sacrifice that guy's given. That was his prized bull, and he's giving it to God. Right? That's what was happening here at this time. They was bringing the sick, the lame, the crippled, the stuff they needed to get rid of. They was bringing it into the temple of God, saying, God don't care, it won't matter. And God's saying, by doing this, by giving me less than perfect, you're despising my name. You despise who I am. You know, anytime we sell God short, we're despising, we're, we're cheapening who Jesus is, that sacrifice that he made for us. When we give less than what, that perfection, we're, we're despising who he is. Because you may say, you know, I've never brought a sick cow to God and offered it to him, but... But, do we offer him our very best? Or do we just give God what's left over? He'll accept nothing less than our best. Nothing. He says here, if we go on and read, he says, and when you offer the blindest to sacrifice, it is not evil. And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? He says, offer it to your own government, the stuff that you're giving me. He says, I'll tell you what, treat your friends and family like you treat me. Would they be happy with you? If you said, all right, I'll pencil you in for one hour, one day this week, and then I'm just going to sit around with you. I'll talk to you some. Unless I really need something. And then I'll come and get you and tell you what I need. He says, would, would your family be okay with that? Would your friends be okay with that? He says, I'm, I'm, I'm God. He says, I have no pleasure in you. He says, when, in, the, in the next verse, in verse 10, when verse 10 it says, who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle a fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord's host, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. Pretty strong words from God when he says, you know, you might as well shut the doors at the temple if that's the way you're going to treat me. Because I'd rather you not give me any sacrifice at all than to profane my name. Pretty strong words, huh? But we see the people are still saying, how are we profaning your name? 
how we how we doing this? In verse eleven, it says, "From the rising of the sun even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations," says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it, in that you say, "The table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit is contemptible." He's telling them. He says. My name should be great among all the nations. The Gentiles that are outside these gates should be looking upon me with reverence even and say, that is God. He's, he's a great God. But he says, you're all profane. About it. By the way you treat me here in this temple, what example are you giving to the people outside? He says, by the way that you're treating this as worthless, he says, people's watching. And they're seeing that. He said, my name should be great, but it's being drugged through the mud by you priests. The priest was to set the example for the people. Israel was to be God's witness to the world, but they was profaning it the way they was acting. You know, we don't have priests today because we are the priests, right? Right? We're the priests. We, we no longer need a high priest to go through to get to God. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we now have direct access. We are priests, which means now this warning comes straight onto us, and we're to set the example. We're to set the example for our friends and our families and those people around us. They should respect God by seeing Him through each one of us, right? But this ain't the way it was happening. Just the same way they have drifted, we've drifted. We've drifted. And a lot of people will say, yeah, well, it ain't that bad. It ain't that bad. It's bad. It's bad. We've drifted. I don't have to convince you of this. God is not revered the way he used to be just a few generations ago. And we've talked about this before. A few generations ago, Stores wasn't open on Sunday. Very few restaurants was open on Sunday. Right? We would never think of them playing ball games on Sunday. They wouldn't even practice on Wednesday night. Now they don't blink at it. We've drifted. We've drifted away from God. A lot of churches now, even in this area, have stopped having Wednesday night services just because people won't come anymore. People won't come. It's not important anymore. We've drifted. We've drifted. And the thing is, is God doesn't change. We do. Right? God, God doesn't change. When we say, oh, I've drifted far from God, we're the one that's drifted because God is still where he always has been, on his throne. He doesn't move. We have drifted. Let's go on. And I know this is, I hope you wore your steel toes, because I know this is stomping on toes today, but know that God stomped on my toes first. When, when, when I read this and when God laid this on my heart to, to preach today, he was stomping my toes too. He really was. In verse 13 it says, You also say, Oh, what a weariness, and you sneer at it says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord God? He says, you're coming in saying, oh, what a weariness this is. We don't have to come to church. We get to come to church. You understand? We, we don't have to come to church. We get to come to church. It's, it amazes me. We have no problem. It's baseball season. We have no problem going out and sitting in the bleachers in the hot sun for three or four hours watching ball games. No big deal. We have no problem in the wintertime sitting in the cold in the bleachers watching the football game. It's no big deal. But if a church service goes two or three minutes past, it's the end of the world. See into the world, right? 
Do you see a problem with that? Do you see a problem? I mean, we can go to the movies and sit for two or three hours and watch a movie and never get tired and not have to get up eight times to go out. But we can't stay an hour in God's house. We don't have to go to church. We get to. D.L. Moody, it said that he came home one time, and although he was very weary from all these travels, he was getting ready to go to another meeting without taking time to rest. And his family begged him to cancel so he could rest. But he told them, I get tired in the work, but I never get tired of the work. And he went on. You know, we're going to get tired in this world, in the work. But we can never get tired of the work. Of spreading God's love to each other. We can never get tired. If, if your heart's not in it, it becomes weariness. If we're here for the wrong reasons, it will become weariness. It will become laborious. It will become a job. But if your heart's in the right place, you should get up Sunday morning excited to be in the Lord's house. Can't wait to get there because I'm going to worship. Right? Not only am I going to worship, I'm going to worship with my family. Together, we're going to worship the Lord. We don't have to go to church. We get to go to church. We get to. If we go on, the last verse here says, But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among nations. He says, Cursed is the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. He's saying, Back then, there was people making great vows to God. They had had a a large flock of animals, and they have this this wonderful, unblemished, fine specimen. And they says, that right there, that's the one I'm going to sacrifice to God. Look how pretty that is. Look how great that is. Then when it comes time to pay up, they're like, you know, I got this one over here that's got a broke leg and it's just, it's just been a pain. I really need to get rid of it. And you know, God understands what my needs are. He, he, he would never be mad at me because he knows that I really need that good one back there because that's, that's the one. So I'm going to take this one because God would understand. Right? That's what he's saying here. He's saying you made a vow. Keep it. Keep it. He says, if you're not going to keep it, don't make it. Don't make it. He says, it's a voluntary thing anyway. He didn't tell you to. We made a vow. He says, keep it. In Ecclesiastes 5, verse 4 and 5, it says, When you make a vow to God and do not when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better to not vow than to vow and to not pay. He says. You've made a vow. Pay your vow. You know, a lot of us here today have made vows to God. Are we keeping those vows? Or are we just giving Him what's left over? Are we justifying in our mind the same way, saying, yeah, but God understands. You know, I said that I'd do that, but God's the one who made me. He knows that I'm this way, so it'll be okay. Not what he's saying, right? He said, if you make a vow, pay your vow. He says he has no pleasure in those that don't keep their vows. Yeah, I know that. Like I said, I know this is one of those stomp your toes type things and, and like I said he stomps my toes too but you know when we give God anything less than our best 
we're cheapening who Jesus Christ is. And that transfers out into the world today. And we see it. We see it out in the world today that God doesn't have the respect that he deserves. He doesn't have the respect that he had just a few generations ago. And it gets worse every generation that we keep this up. What's it going to be down the road another generation or two? You know, there's no backup plan. There's no plan B. We're plan A to go out and share the gospel with the world. There's no plan B. You know, we're one generation away from the gospel being lost and not taught at all. And it's up to us to, to go out and show them who God is. To show God the respect that he deserves. God doesn't ask for perfection. He asks for your best. There's a big difference. You may say, well, I don't have, I don't have that prize animal to, to, to give sacrifice to God. He don't want perfection. He wants your best. He wants what your best is. He accepts nothing less. And he shouldn't. He shouldn't. He, he gave his best when he gave his son to die on the cross. That perfect lamb of God. He held nothing back. He could have said, ah, you know, but that's my son. They would understand that I wouldn't want to give my son to die for a bunch of people that probably ain't even going to care about me. But he didn't. He said, I'm going to freely give my son to pay for their sins. Jesus said, I'm going to freely give my life to pay for their sins because it's the only way. God held nothing back so we can't hold nothing back from him. And you know what the funny thing is, is we're always so worried about losing something or giving something up. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. No, that's not a prosperity message. God's blessings will be more and more. And, and you can see that as you read through Malachi. I love the way God's a big God, and he says, try me, try me. He said, do it and see if I don't bless you for this. Do it and see. He said, try me. you got nothing to lose. Are we bringing God our best? If not today, I ask you, if you'd pray and ask God to, to search your heart. Say, God, if I drifted, am I where I need to be? Am I profaning your name by the way that I am offering myself to you? And maybe if that's the case, to renew that vow. Like I said, those vows was completely voluntary. But vows are a good thing when we keep them. As we go to a time of, of invitation here, um, I'm going to ask you all if you would bow your heads. I ask that uh, if you're here today and you're lost and don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, God gave his very best for you, for you personally, so that you could have a home in heaven so that you would not be separated. He paid it all, and all he asked us today is to receive that free gift. If that's you here today, I pray that you would answer that call from God, that you would invite him into your heart. Believer, Are you so caught up in life that you're missing God? Missing who God is? Are you just going through the motions and it's become a weariness even to worship? I ask you today, pray that God would search your heart. 
pray that he would put us back on the track where we need to be. Renew your vows with him today. You could pray that prayer that says, God, I'm not where I should be. I'm not even where I started out. But God, I want to be. And God will put you back in that track that we can have that closer walk to him, that we can not profane his name. Maybe God's speaking to your heart today. Maybe there's something else he's laid on your heart. I don't know what that is, but whatever it may be, if God's speaking to you today, listen to his voice, answer the call. Father, we come to you again. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And Father, I pray for each one here that you would speak to our hearts, Father, and we would have the courage to step out on whatever it is you're telling us to do. In Jesus' name. Amen.